Welcome to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Office of Housing Voucher Programs training on the Project Based Voucher Program. Today's presenters will be Phyllis Smelkinson, Trinessa Sidney, Diane Thompson, and, and myself, Tiffany Johnson. Here's Diane with an overview. Good morning. The agenda for part one of today's training uh, will include an overview of the project-based voucher program, implementing a PBV program, the types of housing that are eligible for project-based voucher assistance, proposal process, site selection, unit cap requirements and accepted units, pre-AHAP or agreement to enter into a housing assistance payments contract requirements, and the AHAP itself. Some of the background, legislative background, will, is listed on this slide. Uh, the program is authorized by Section 8013 of the United States Housing Act of 1937. Uh, the act has been amended several times, most recently by the Housing Economic and Recovery Act in 2008, which we refer to as HARA. Uh, in 2000, the Fiscal Year 2001 Appropriations Act and the Quality Housing and Work Responsibility Act of uh, 1998. The project-based voucher program is an optional component of the tenant-based housing choice voucher program. It's an effective, flexible tool that allows public housing authorities to attach rental assistance to specific housing units. It increases affordable housing opportunities for low-income families. It improves voucher utilization in tight housing markets, and it deconcentrates poverty. The project-based voucher program is administered by a public housing authority that administers the tenant-based housing choice voucher program under an annual contributions contract with HUD, or an ACC. HUD does not provide special funding or a separate appropriations for the project-based voucher program, except for HUD VASH PBV. A PHA can project base up to 20% of its voucher budget authority, and project-based voucher assistance is attached to a particular project. The statute defines project as a single building, multiple contiguous buildings, or multiple buildings on contiguous parcels of land. Housing authorities award PBV contracts to project owners through an owner selection proposal for either existing housing, rehabilitated housing, or housing that is newly constructed. When a PHA plans to implement a project-based voucher program, there are several things that the PHA must ensure uh, happens prior to implementing the program. The PHA uh, must ensure that PB, the PBV program is consistent with its PHA plan. The PHA plan is a five-year annual plan that provides the strategic planning framework for management and operations and capital planning. The Housing Authority must also update its administrative plan for the Section 8 program, which is its written policies and procedures for operating both the voucher program and the project-based voucher program. The PHA must state in its PHA plan its policy for developing project-based vouchers, the project, projected number of units that the PHA proposes to pro project base, and also in the PHA plan they must identify the general locations where the projects will be developed prior to implementing the project-based voucher program. The policy must be consistent with the program site and neighborhood standards, and the policy must also be consistent with the PHA's policy on poverty, deconcentration, and expansion of housing and economic opportunities. The administrative plan uh, must include the following policies specifically for the project-based voucher program. Prior to selecting units, the, the plan must include the procedures for selecting PBV pro proposals, including how a PHA will solicit proposals, the definition of compliance with housing quality standards, which we will get into a little later in the presentation, uh, compliance with project-based voucher goals, civil, civil rights requirements, 
and its standard for deconcentrating poverty and expanding housing and economic opportunities. In establishing the, and operating a PBV program, the PHA must comply with the PHA pl plan civil rights and affirmatively furthering fair housing certification submitted by the PHA in accordance with 24 CFR 903.70. Policies for site selection and how policies will promote the project-based voucher goals as well as uh, further information that's included in PIH Notice 2011-54. Additional local requirements must also be included in the PHA plan. If the PHA plans to promote partially assisted building, buildings, um, establish a per project cap, determine not to provide project-based voucher assistance for accepted units, or establish a project cap of less than 25%. Those items would need to be included in the Housing Authority's administrative plan if they plan to implement any of those. Waiting list selection policies must be included. Families that will receive supportive services in uh, units that are above and beyond the 25% limitation. Those supportive services must be identified in the PHA's administrative plan. Tenant screening, if the Housing Authority plans to do discretionary screening of tenants, then that policy must also be included in their plan. Family occupancy of wrong sized or accessible units, how the Housing Authority will manage wrong sized unit uh, occupancy under PBV would have to be included. Uh, and also whether the Housing Authority plans to allow for vacancy payments under the Project Based Voucher Program must also be included in the administrative plan. There are uh, submission requirements that the Housing Authority must also comply with at least 14 calendar days prior to the date that the PHA intends to issue a request for proposals or make a selection based on a previous competition, the PHA must submit to the HUD field office the total amount of annual, annual budget authority the PHA has under its ACC, the percentage of the annual budget authority available to be project-based, the total amount of annual budget authority that the PHA plans to project base pursuant to the number of units the budget authority will support, and the Housing Authority would need to submit this information to PBV submissions at HUD.gov with a copy of the information sent to the relevant Public Housing Field Office Director. For additional information on these submission requirements, the Housing Authority should refer to PIH Notice 2015-5. Hi, I'm Tiffany Johnson, and I'm here to introduce the types of housing that are eligible and ineligible for project-based voucher program. Um, the ineligible types of housing include shared housing, institutional housing, nursing homes or similar medical facilities, housing controlled by an educational institution, manufactured housing, transitional housing, home ownership units. The subsidized housing that is ineligible is public housing, except when it's being converted from RAD, other Section 8, including tenant-based units, Section 36 rental assistant payments, Section 515 rental assistant payments, Section 202 or Section 811 project, home tenant-based assistance, or other federal, state, or local government subsidy assistance housing. The types of housing that are eligible housing are existing housing units that already exist on proposal uh, selection date and that substantially comply with HQS on that date. This is very important. In addition, rehabilitated housing is also eligible housing. Um, housing units that exist on the proposal selection date but do not substantially comply with the HQS on that date and are developed pursuant to an agreement between the PHA and owner for use under the PBB program. Additionally, we also encourage you to look at new construction as an eligible housing type. Housing units that do not exist at the proposal selection date and are developed after the date of selection pursuant to enter into an agreement to enter into a HAP contract between the PHA and owner for use under the PBB program.
Units are ineligible for selection as existing, new, or rehabilitated housing when, for existing housing, when the units do not substantially comply with housing quality standards, when units previously selected as new construction or rehabilitated housing. Units are ineligible for selection as new construction housing and rehabilitated housing when the construction begin begins after the proposal submission but prior to the AHAP, or when construction begins prior to the environmental review or and subsidy layering review. And we'll cover those later on in the slides. There are two selection methods that the PHA may utilize in selecting units for the project-based voucher program. The Housing Authority may issue a request for proposals or an RFP, or they may select based on a previous federal, state, or local government housing assistance program, community development program, or supportive services program that required the competitive selection of proposals. When a housing authority is selecting project-based voucher units based on a request for proposal, the housing authority must provide broad, a broad public advertisement. That advertisement can be in the form of a newspaper. It can be posted on the housing authority's website. It must be broad in nature, however, so the housing authority cannot limit the advertisement to a particular project or a particular location. The advertisement must include the housing types that the PHA will be selecting, whether it be existing, newly constructed, or rehabilitation. It must also include the submission deadline. The administrative plan that the Housing Authority develops for the project-based voucher program must include the selection criteria that it will use to select proposals. The criteria factors such as site design, project feasibility, and points that will be assigned for each factor. When the Housing Authority plans to select based on a previous competition, such as the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, the competition must have occurred within three years of the project-based voucher pro proposal selection date. The competition must not have included or involved any consideration that the project would receive project-based voucher assistance. The administrative plan must include the selection criteria for previous competition selections. For example, the, there is a requirement that a proposal by the owner be submitted for a previous competition. So the Housing Authority's administrative plan must include when they will accept proposals, how they will accept proposals, et cetera. The Housing Authority must also verify that the previous competition is in fact a program for federal, state, or local housing assistance. The PHA procedures for selecting PBV proposals must be designed and actually operated to provide broad public notice. The public notice procedures may include publication in a local newspaper of general circulation, the PHA's website, on-site in the PHA's office, other means designed and actually operated to provide public notice. The public notice must specify the proposal deadline and detailed application and selection information must be provided at the request of any interested party. Once the PHA selects an owner for PBV assistance, the Housing Authority must provide written notice to the selected party. The notice must include the date of proposal selection. If there are conditions of selection, the notice must also include that, as well as the next steps. For example, when construction can, can and cannot commence in the case of a newly constructed project. Public review of the PHA selection decision documentation must also meet, be made available. The documents may, meet, may be made available for public review on the PHA's website, at the PHA's office, or other general location. Previous participation clearance, um, HUD Form 2530, is not required for PBV selection. The AHAP and the HAP do require certification by the owner that the owner and the part project's principals are not on the U.S. General Services Administration list of parties excluded from federal procurement and non-procurement programs. 
The selection process for PHA-owned units is slightly different. PHA-owned means that the PHA or its officers, employees, agents, or, in, or an entity of the PHA holds any direct or indirect interest in the building. Direct or indirect interest includes, but is not limited to, title holder, stockholder, member or general or limited partner of a partnership, member of a limited liability corporation. The PHA must submit to HUD or a HUD approved independent entity, which we will discuss in just a few minutes, all proposals submitted for project-based voucher assistance. Also, a copy of the PHA's administrative plan must be submitted, a copy of the request for proposals, if applicable, and a copy of the proposal for the previous competition and the award letter, also if applicable. If a PHA selects a proposal for, for PHA-owned units, the units may only be assisted if the field office or HUD-approved entity reviews the Housing Authority selection process and determines that the PHA-owned units were appropriately selected based on the selection procedures that are specified in the Housing Authority's administrative plan. The Housing Authority's selection procedures apply to all project-based voucher proposals. And again, those procedures must be designed in a manner that does not effectively eliminate the submission of proposals for non-PHAO units, nor gives any kind of preferential treatment, example additional points, to PHA-owned units. What is an independent entity? An independent entity may be the unit of general local government or a HUD-approved independent entity, for example, such as a neighboring PHA. If the PHA is itself the unit of general local government or an agency of such government, the independent entity must be a HUD-approved public or private entity. The independent entity and PHA must possess an autonomous relationship. They may not be connected for legally, financially, except for compensation for services performed in connection with the PHA-owned units, or in any other manner that could cause either party to improperly be influenced by the other. Bottom line, the relationship has to be completely independent. All PHA-owned units must be selected by either an independent entity or the HUD field office. The PHA must notify HUD of its intent to use an independent entity for PBV proposal selection prior to using that entity. The Housing Authority must submit documentation concerning the independent entity to the field office. HUD must determine the independent nature of the proposed independent entity. And HUD must either approve or disapprove the independent entity and will notify the PHA in writing. If the PHA uses a previously approved independent entity, the PHA simply must certify in writing to HUD that they will be using the same independent entity prior to AHAP. HUD or the HUD approved independent entity must validate the unit selection in accordance with the PHA's administrative plan. The independent entity must determine rent reasonableness, and any rent determinations, as well as do initial and subsequent inspections of PBV units. The independent entity must also approve the HAP contract term. The term of the HAP contract and any HAP contract renewal for PHA-owned units must be agreed upon by the PHA and the independent entity approved by HUD. Any costs associated with implementing this requirement must be borne by the PHA. For PHA-owned units, the contract administrator and the owner of the project cannot be the same legal entity. The PHA, acting as the contract administrator, cannot execute a contract with itself as the owner of the project-based voucher units. Rather, the PHA has to establish a separate legal entity to serve as the owner. 
Such entity may be a nonprofit affiliate or instrumentality of the PHA, a limited liability corporation established by the PHA, of which the PHA is a member, a limited partnership of which the PHA is a member, a corporation, or any other legally acceptable entity recognized by the applicable state law. Hi, I'm Trinessa Sidney, and I'm a Housing Program Specialist in the Office of Housing Voucher Programs. Site Selection Standards. The PHA may not select a proposal for existing, new construction, or rehabilitated housing on a site or enter into an AHAP or HAP contract for units on the site unless the PHA has determined that the housing selected is consistent with the goals of deconcentrating poverty in expanding housing and economic opportunities. These goals and other policies must be established in the PHA's administrative plan, and it must state how the PHA's site selection procedures promote the PBV goals. Site and neighborhood standards are prescribed for new construction, existing, and rehabilitated housing in 24 CFR, 983.57, the location of the project must satisfy HUD's site and neighborhood standards under this regulation. One of the statutory and primary goals of PBV is to deconcentrate poverty, expand housing, and economic opportunities. Policies and activities must be consistent with the PHA's plan as outlined in 24 CFR Part 903 and the PHA's administrative plan. The PHA must consider the following when developing the standards to apply in determining whether a proposed PBV development will be selected. Some of these factors to consider include HUD designated enterprise zone, economic community, or renewal community, whether the project will be in a census tract where assisted concentration of units decrease as a result of public housing demolition, census tract undergoing significant revitalization, and also areas of state, local, or federal dollar investment. And several other factors also apply, as you can see. Now to discuss unit cap and accepted units. Under the PBV program, not more than 25% of the units in a project can have PBV assistance. PHAs, of course, may establish a lower unit cap on the number of units in a project that may be assisted. There is an exception to the 25% cap on PBV units. Housing authorities may have exceptions to, these, to this cap if they are attaching PBV assistance to single family units, and these are units that have are one, two, four units. Other accepted units under the exceptions to the unit cap include accepted units available to qualifying families, such as elderly families, disabled families, or families receiving supportive services, such as family self-sufficiency. Qualifying families include elderly families, disabled, or a family where at least one member is receiving at least one qualifying supportive service that is described in the PHA's administrative plan. The PHA may not require participation in medical or disability related services. The family is also qualifying if the family is participating in the Family Self-Sufficiency Program or FSS program or other qualifying supportive services. In instances where the qualifying member is no longer able to reside in the unit for circumstances outside of the family's control, the PHA may permit continued occupancy of the remaining family members. In cases where the family fails to participate or participate in or receive supportive services without good cause, the PHA must terminate assistance to the family. Accepted units retain its, their accepted unit status as long as the family resides in or is replaced by another qualifying family. The PHA must include in its administrative plan for accepted units the type of services offered to families to qualify for exception, the extent to which services will be provided, services are not required to be provided at or by the site. 
The Housing Authority must also include the form and frequency of PHA monitoring of families, receipt of supportive services. The Housing Authority may establish local requirements in its PHA plan where it establishes a per project cap of less than 25%, or it can limit PBV assistance to 25%, which is the unit cap, which means the Housing Authority is not allowing for exceptions. Hello, I'm Phyllis Malkinson. I'm a housing program specialist, and I will continue with the last two sections of the initial training. First, there are two types of contracts in the project-based voucher program. There's the AHAP, which we have discussed and will continue to discuss, and the HAP contract. Please note that HUD is not a party to either contract. The AHAP is a commitment between the owner and the PHA that upon satisfactory completion of the construction or rehabilitation of the project, a HAP contract may be executed. It provides the terms of development. It conveys the owner's responsibilities to comply with federal requirements such as Section 3 training employment and contracting opportunities, equal opportunity employment, labor standards, and Davis-Bacon wage requirements. Okay, we will go over where, where the AHAP comes in in the order of things. The PHA and housing owner enter, enter into the AHAP for new construction and rehabilitation. The environmental review, complete release of funds issued and subsidy layering review, the PHA and owner sign the AHAP, construction begins. The two things that are really crucial and we seem to find the most difficulties are the environmental review and subsidy layering review, which must be done before the AHAP is executed, and it would occur right after selection. The agreement specifies the site, location of contract units, nature of the work, Uniform Relocation Act requirements, the exhibits include the approved owner's proposal, description of the work, including drawings, plans, and specifications, description of housing, including estimate of initial rents, number of contract units and utilities, and the HAP contract not executed. Davis-Bacon wage rates must be paid to laborers and mechanics employed in the development of the housing for projects with nine or more units. Owners and owners contractors and subcontractors must comply with the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act and all other applicable federal labor relations laws and regulations. The PHA is responsible for monitoring compliance with these standards. Davis-Bacon requirements and addendum to existing HAP contract can be found and these are the sites where you can find information, more information on Davis-Bacon. The Davis-Bacon Act prevailing wage rates apply to construction, including rehab contracts, in excess of $2,000. Davis-Bacon wage rates must be paid to laborers and mechanics employed in the development of new construction or rehabilitated housing under the PBV program for projects with nine or more units. Now we're going to get into the applicability of labor standards for existing housing. For existing housing, the PHA must analyze the scope and timing of repair work to determine applicability of Davis-Bacon. If an owner is still required to comply with labor standards, if repair work performed is within 18 months post HAP, constitutes development of, of housing. An owner certifies that repair work on an existing housing project, the PHA determines to be development activity, shall be in compliance with Davis-Bacon requirements. The scope, the elements of the proposed work, the specific activities involved, development encompasses work on a Section 8 project that is comparable to the scope of work HUD has determined constitutes development of a public housing project. 
timing, development work initiated on existing units within 18 months after the effective date of the HAP contract is considered development for purposes of Davis-Bacon applicability. Addendum to existing HAP contract that reflects the applicability of Davis-Bacon wage rates in the development of existing housing must be included if applicable. Development includes, for existing housing, remodeling work that alters the nature or type of housing units in the PBV project. It would include reconstruction or a substantial improvement in quality or kind of original equipment and materials. Development does not include replacement of equipment and materials rendered unsatisfactory because of normal wear and tear. The owner must comply with Section 3 of the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968, Federal Equal Opportunity Requirements of Executive Orders 11246 as amended, 11625, 12432, and 12138. The PHA shall not enter an AHAP, and sometimes this is also called the agreement, if construction or rehabilitation started after proposal submission and prior to the execution of the AHAP. These are pre-AHAP requirements. And we're going to get into in detail the subsidy layering review and environmental review, both of which must be done prior to execution of the AHAP. Prior to executing the AHAP contract, the HAP contract, sorry, the PHA must inspect all units in the project to ensure the units pass HQS. For proposed existing housing, the PHA must perform pre-inspection to determine whether units substantially comply with HQS. An environmental review is the process of reviewing a project and its potential environmental impacts to determine whether it meets federal, state, and local environmental standards. The environmental review ensures that the proposed project does not negatively impact the surrounding environment and that the project itself will not have an adverse environmental or health effect on end users. Every project must be in compliance with NEPA and other federal related state and environmental laws. And this review, environmental review, applies to all three types of housing. National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, applies to project-based voucher assistance. The responsible entity, such as a unit of general local government, county or state, is responsible for completing the federal environmental review. Environmental reviews are required for existing, rehabilitation, and new construction. An owner and its contractors may not acquire, dispose of, demolish, construct real property, or commit, including entering into an AHAP or HAP, or expend program or local funds for PVV activities until one of the following has occurred. The environmental review has been completed and HUD has approved the environmental certification and request for a lease of funds. The responsible entity has determined that the project is exempt or categorically excluded and not subject to compliance with environmental laws or HUD has performed an environmental review under Part 50 and has notified the PHA in writing of environmental approval of the site. Keep in mind PBV assistance is not tenant-based assistance for determining whether PBV activity is categorically excluded under NEPA. Supplemental PBV assistance is categorically excluded under 24 CFR Part 58.35B7 in cases where there is a proposal to attach PBV assistance to a project that currently has other forms of federal assistance and where an environmental review has already been performed by the same responsible entity and reevaluation of the environmental review findings is not required by regulation. In such cases, a request for a lease of funds is not required 
but the responsible entity must update the environmental review record to reflect the supplemental assistance in accordance with the environmental regulations. Where the responsible, responsible entity has determined the project is exempt or categorically excluded, the HUD Office of Public Housing would not necessarily be made aware of such determination since the responsible entity relays its findings to the PHA and not HUD. To avoid possible findings of noncompliance, PHAs are encouraged to notify their local HUD Office of Public Housing Director of the RE's determination and provide HUD with documentation evidencing the determination. Now we're getting into the next pre-AHAP requirement, the subsidy layering review. The statutory requirement is Section 102D of the HUD Reform Act. Subsidy layering reviews prevent excessive public assistance federal, state, or local agencies, including assistance such as tax concessions for tax credits, from being combined or layered with housing assistance payment subsidy under the PBV program for housing projects. The owner must disclose to the PHA information regarding any form of government assistance that is made available or expected to be made available for the project. The PHA may not execute an AHAP until a subsidy layering review has been performed by HUD headquarters, an independent entity approved by HUD, or a, housing, a qualified housing credit agency that has notified HUD of its intent to participate in accordance with the administrative guidelines and the publication is noted. So we have a list of all housing credit agencies that can perform the subsidy layering review. If your state's housing credit agency is not on the list, then HUD has to do the review. The subsidy layering review is required prior to the execution of an AHAP for new construction and for projects that will undergo rehabilitation. The PHA must request a subsidy layering review from a participating housing credit agency or from HUD headquarters staff if a participating HCA is not located in the PHA's jurisdiction. There's the website where the participating list of HCAs can be located. And the Appendix D of the Administrative Guidelines lists the documents that PHAs must submit to the HCA or HUD headquarters for the subsidy layering reviews. And notice 2013-11 outlines the process for requesting a subsidy layering review be performed by HUD. And last but not least, a subsidy layering review is not required for existing housing. No duplication of subsidy layering reviews of HUD's designee a housing credit agency has conducted a review which included a review of PBV assistance in accordance with the administrative guidelines. A further subsidy layering review is not required. Additional governmental assistance requires a subsequent subsidy layering review. If an owner receives additional government assistance for the project that results in an increase in the project financing, is an amount equal to or greater than 10% of the original development budget. Pre-AHAP requirements and subsidy layering review resources are listed on this page, on this slide, and there's no need to go over them. They're there for your assistance. This concludes part one of the PBV program training webcast. Please join us for part two of the training available on the Project-Based Voucher website.